So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, one of the first pieces of advice I got the first time I, I got to London, quite a long time ago, was to mind the gap. Um, and you know, those are words to live by. Not quite as, as powerful as keep home and carry on, but uh, quite useful. Um, and our industry, the water industry, is obviously mindful of, of the gap. I think that if we take a look at the different challenges, goals, targets, duties of a water utility, and we just just some of them on the screen, there's clearly a lot of information that we need to take into consideration. And if you look at some of the uh, systems, platforms, types of data that the water utility has and can use, uh, and again, this, this is just a partial list, one might suspect that we've got it covered, that we know so much. But that's exactly uh, the gap we're talking about. How to make that data, this information, useful and relevant for the purposes, for the challenges that the industry is, is facing. Industry trends and technologies are leading uh, each and every one of the utilities uh, that were on stage before and everyone else to having more data, more types of data, more frequently. So why, why is that, that we're uh, so information uh, poor? Um, maybe it has to do with having too much data. You know, human beings are looking at many types of data. Uh, it's a lot of data. So you know, venture capitalists in the room, uh, and obviously most of us have heard about big data. Uh, if uh, you've got a big data startup, you'll get in here with, with uh, investors, not sure about water. Um, so maybe we have a big data problem in the uh, water, water space. Well, the internet is big data. Telecoms is big data. Uh, water is medium data at best. I mean, we're talking about a few dozens or hundreds or thousands of, of meters and sensors in the network sending you know, a few signals per hour or per day. That's not a lot of data. The GIS systems, billing systems, anything that the water utility has today, asset management, it's not a lot of data. So it might not be a big data problem. I think that, that what the industry is facing is the fact that we're really um, in the show business, um, in the words of Irving Berlin. Um, this industry is really about, about showing. Um, you know, uh, every technology company, every systems integrator, every water company look at, looking at technology solutions um, that make use of data uh, is in the business of, of showing. So the first thing is obviously the need to uh, show the money. You know, if you're a technology company approaching a water utility, and if you're a water utility uh, entertaining uh, a technology company, it's all about the business case, about return on investment, making the case for, for technology. Now, the problem or the challenge is that data is often regarded as a byproduct of some other solution system. The data is not a product and it's not a valuable element in the equation. So trying to pitch having more data for the sake of having more data is doomed to fail. And what we are, what we need to do as an industry, what we are trying to do is to get water utilities and vendors and consultants, investors of course, uh, to come up with more cohesive business cases that will make the case uh, for the use of, of more data, not in the context of a single project or a single element, rather on, on the whole. So let's assume we've shown the money. Not very easy to do, but let's assume we, we, we have it done. Um, now you need to show that the thing works. And I think uh, James was making the point yesterday about the piloting, um, the uh, value of death for many technology companies, obviously the smaller ones, uh, just the need of the utility to make sure that the thing works in a sandbox or in a contained and long piloting fashion before it's being thrown uh, to the water network. We're in the business of delivering water. We're not, uh, in, we're not a sandbox. So 
let's wait for this to be proven. And this uh, kills or slows down innovation to a very large extent. And even if you can convince the water utility to try new technology, um, you've got to show them the way. Because even the most advanced and most uh, uh, forward-thinking water utility cannot come up with all the best practices and all the best ways to use the different technologies that the industry is putting forth to them. So it's for us, the people on stage, the people uh, in the audience, to work together uh, to make sure that uh, water utilities can, can actually make the most of the technologies that are out there. And that's where uh, the Smart Water Network forum, the Smart Forum comes into the picture. Uh, what the Smart Forum is about is working together as an industry to uh, make sure that we've got the right means and tools to, do, to be in the show business, you know, the business cases, the interoperability between systems, the best practices, make it available to all the different counterparts, all the different stakeholders uh, in the industry. Um, and here you can just see a, a piece of research that the SWAN Forum has recently released. Uh, this is what water utilities, and we had about 20 participating in the survey, what they think uh, their data uh, can do for them. Um, and if the uh, bit's too small, we're going to talk about many of those uh, later. But and I hope that uh, JFK is not going to roll over uh, when I uh, do this. Uh, it's not about uh, what your data can do for you. It's about what you can do for your data. Um, what you do is, on the whole, are not paying uh, enough attention to what they can do for the data. Getting more sensors and meters, getting more systems out there, and make those systems work for them and serve those other processes that are going on, again, for the benefit of the utility, for the benefit of the industry. So now that I, I killed JFK again, um, I'm going to invite uh, uh, three uh, members of the uh, Smart Water Network community uh, to, to stage. And I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Paul Joel Derian. He's a ser uh, Senior Vice President of Research, Innovation, and Performance um, in uh, Suez and Vivoma. And uh, we should have had a cake here because uh, he's celebrating his first anniversary in, in Suez. Uh, have enjoyed from from Rodia, uh, where he was again. I, you've got his CV in your uh, conference guides. You know, his his uh, history and his uh, academic pedigree is too. It's going to take much of our time. So do resort to your uh, to your guides, and I'm going to invite uh, Pozre to uh, be the first. Thank you, Derek. Okay. Good morning, or. It's going to be lunch time soon. Uh, okay, so it's almost good afternoon. Uh, let, let's take a bit. Uh, should I go to the campus computer or it works? Uh, okay. Uh, so I, I'm going to speak uh, from a Suez uh, standpoint of uh, what we think about smart water and how it's, it's deployed. Uh, but let's let's speak uh, first about what is smart water for us. Uh, it's going from, uh, I would say, uh, the mere smart metering about uh, getting the data on a more intelligent way to uh, smarter operation. Uh, of course, uh, the, the network and the power optimization, energy, leak detection, uh, leak detection to uh, smart environmental monitoring. So what it is about is to, uh, I would say, create new value added services and improve the performance of our uh, operation using uh, uh, communication information technology in uh, the water business throughout the water cycle. That means from the time you take the water from nature to the time you get the water back to nature. Uh, I actually, uh, before moving to the examples, uh, actually this venture into uh, smart water started years ago, actually almost 20 years ago, uh, with the SCADA and the different systems that were put in place in the most modern operation. And uh, actually, it's uh, what you can observe, it's a very slow pace at which the technology is being adopted uh, in the world. Uh, but let's go through uh, some examples uh, about smart metering. Uh, so far, it's above, actually, it's north of uh, 1 million water meters that we've been installing worldwide. Uh, so it's already a sig very significant number, uh, but it's still very s small compared to the uh, almost uh, 100 million uh, uh, consumer that we are, uh, we are servicing. 
uh, we are uh, delivering uh, those uh, meters in different regions of the world. Uh, one interesting thing is that we see more and more synergism with other utilities, uh, uh, gas metering and water metering going together, uh, energy metering, and also delivering other services uh, for industrial markets, for instance, the example of the, the train services in France, SNCF. Uh, about uh, network and being smart on managing the network, again, uh, some example about, I would say, the management of the network from uh, decision-making support tools, public <coughs> detection, maintenance and distribution uh, optimization, energy optimization. So all these smart technologies exist uh, and are being implemented in different uh, uh, facilities that are being managed throughout the world. Uh, in terms of, I would say, going to the environment, which was because it was the last, I would say, level of, I would say, implementation of smart technology, uh, uh, I can take the example, of, for instance, of storm water management. Uh, uh, information technology is very important to manage uh, your networks, and that's. Uh, the wastewater uh, network uh, or, or, or the stormwater networks uh, to optimize uh, their dimensions and to avoid, uh, I would say, flooding in, in major cities. That's the case of Bordeaux, that's the case of the region of Paris, for instance. Uh, another example could be also uh, the uh, connection of this stormwater with uh, the quality of water on, on the shore, uh, bathing water, and uh, for instance, in Barcelona or San Luis, you have a, 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 a continuous monitoring of the, of the environment to predict the quality of the water uh, that you're going to offer to uh, the people uh, on the shore. Uh, let's let's talk briefly about how or what could accelerate the implementation of, of those technology uh, in, uh, I would say, in the world. Uh, in, our, uh, in the water world. And I, I've taken three levels in my science. One is about uh, economic and technical solution, uh, cost reduction, clearly uh, we scale to reduce the capex and the opex of, of, of these different technologies. Clearly combining a, a better combination of ICT and, uh, and smart uh, mathematical model with the water process expertise. All these technologies needs, needs to be integrated because you can't have all these different models uh, not being fully integrated and deliver value to the people who are managing this network. And, and last but not least, I believe that uh, a, a more favorable regulatory framework could accelerate the, the adoption. From the, uh, the user perspective, there is still a, a lack of perceived added value. Uh, there are some added value, but we continue and need to continue to uh, emphasize the, uh, the added value, the user friendliness of the, of, of the system, uh, and, uh, and the integration with other services and utilities. And, and in terms of niche approach, I, I think that there are some developments related to water and agriculture. Uh, there are also um, areas uh, where we need to develop uh, smarter technologies uh, for smaller cities. When you have a lot of uh, resources, you can afford to implement those technologies in large cities. I've taken the example of Paris, Bordeaux, and so on. But you need to have also uh, cheaper and more optimized solutions for smaller cities who want to uh, manage, for instance, flood. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roger. It's really good to see the, uh, the way of thinking that Suez is now uh, following. I think we're going to discuss this further, the role of large companies in promoting the, these concepts. Um, and going from uh, large community to a slightly smaller one, um, coming from representing uh, a water-rich area, somewhere in Arizona, right? Um, Trevor, Trevor Hill is uh, co-founder and CEO of Global Water uh, Resources um, and a fellow Smart Water Network Forum member. Um, two years ago, uh, Global Water initiated something called FAPO, uh, it's a software as a service platform and offering um, that I guess Trevor is going to be talking about uh, with us today. 
And again, lots of interesting stuff uh, from his bio on your uh, conference guide, Trevor. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, or afternoon, I suppose. Uh, make no mistake, the water crisis in the world will not be solved on the supply side. I take it as self-evident that, uh, that this is true, although most conferences are dominated by supply-side rhetoric. And so, uh, in the spirit of uh, the panels, that many of which I've been on with Guy, I will give you some uh, uh, controversial views on, uh, on what we think um, Smart Grid for Water is, what it actually does, uh, what it will be, and, and, some, and some evidence to, to back that up. <laughs> the uh, water issues as we've seen them uh, and the ones that are facing London will also be solved on the demand side. Let me give you some examples. In 2006 uh, and seven, Brisbane was able to reduce their water consumption all the way down to something like 36 US gallons per person per day, something along the lines of what London <coughs> is requiring as well. And they did that as a function of, 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 of a variety of, um, of really marketing and, and very dramatic messaging to their, to their populace. But in Phoenix, Arizona, which is where I'm from, uh, we use something greater than 1,000 liters per person per day. Make no mistake, this is a function of uh, price signals that are too weak. We operate in the <coughs> inelastic correlation band uh, in most of North America. And as a function of that, we believe that those behaviors will be persistent in the context of people's water utilization. But in fact, the international evidence suggests that that's not true. The best case study for this is, in fact, uh, post uh, drought conditions in Australia. At the height of their, uh, of their uh, worst drought in history, they uh, uh, begrudgingly, I think to some extent, spent in excess of $20 billion on supply side uh, uh, technologies. And when they did, price signals went up very materially. In some cases, water rates in Australia are $5 a kiloliter, which is nearly $20 per 1,000 US gallons, or 10x what the average water rate in the US is. And when they did that, consumption went down. In some extent, to, to some great extent, in some cases, they turned their supply side solutions off. Now, this is a, 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 a perfect economic model for, uh, for why uh, Smart Grid and the work that my colleagues are doing and what we're doing is so important. And really, uh, and you can read my slide here, we take these uh, precepts as self-evident. The only way, the only way, the only proven way to drive conservation is through price signals and peer pressure. We know this for sure because in the context of international price signals, those that are specifically tied to individuals are those that are tied broadly to regions. In the end, uh, the price signals and or uh, peer pressure uh, results in those types of behavior necessary to drive the demand side. Now, in Brisbane, what happened after some period of time was that the marketing started to break down as a function of the uh, issue of equality. People all wanted to get on the boat initially and conserve uh, together, but eventually they said, no, I'm conserving more than my neighbor. I saw him watering his grass, and the thing falls apart if it's not done on a particular and specific customer basis. For this reason, uh, we believe that the future of uh, Smart Grid for Water is giving price signals to customers in real time. Real time data in customers' hands was sufficient uh, uh, richness of data so that those customers can modify their own behaviors. And for those reasons, we built Fathom. Now what Fathom uh, is, and this is not meant to be a shameless uh, uh, commercial for global, although you will find brochures on every chair in this auditorium. 
my role in life is shameless self-promotion. So let this be no exception. Um, what we did uh, in Global, we own regulated water and wastewater utilities, many of them. And we tied those uh, together uh, as we rolled them up. Uh, we went to the southwestern United States in search of uh, stronger water scarcity drivers so we could build a utility focused on conservation through demand side management tactics. Water reuse, we have the largest uh, water uh, purple pipe uh, recycled water distribution uh, system in Arizona. But beyond that, we were early adopters of AMI technology. We integrated it with a customer uh, information system. If in case the gentleman from Saudi Arabia is still here, I can help you. Uh, and we tied that uh, to, uh, to the geospatial uh, mapping system. So the three critical databases that every utility must have, geospatial data, volumetric data, customer information data, when integrated, is surprisingly powerful. And then we took that data and built uh, uh, it, it into a smartphone application that not only do, uh, uh, provides customers their data in real time, but provides the two essential ingredients that are uh, tantamount to uh, conservation, which is uh, real-time visibility into price signals and real-time benchmarking against their peers. Not only their peers on their street, but their peers in the community. And this, this screenshot is, is one of those uh, there's a few more moving graphics on this other slide, but this, uh, this functionality has been surprisingly uh, effective. And what we've found uh, empirically is that in the presence of this uh, data, tied with things like text messaging, when, when customers are uh, at a certain predetermined dollar value for a month, or entering into a new higher tier, uh, uh, particularly those tiers that are intended to be punitive uh, as you move beyond one or two standard deviations of the mean in your community. When those things occur in the context of, of text messaging or other data, uh, customer behavior quickly begins to change. And this technology is a fraction of the price that some of the supply side, uh, uh, obviously, technologies uh, uh, Cost. When you think about the areas that are making all of their water from first osmosis to salination, for example, then uh, these types of demand side technologies are critical. We then took this technology and began putting it in, uh, in other cities. We have full outsourced smart grid for water back office, including all the cash management associated with that revenue management. And uh, what we found surprisingly was that. In the broad context of non-revenue water, fully half of that is in uh, the, 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 the reported line losses, fully half of it is in, is in data error. Either meters that are not reading correctly or meters that are, are degraded or the quality of the data or the quality of the data in the customer information system or the rate codes or the billing engines. Those uh, account for 50% of non-revenue water in the, in the cities that we've looked at. And so this is another, uh, this is found money for cities. Uh, this is a critical uh, uh, finding in terms of helping cities increase revenue while maintaining, uh, uh, maintaining their cost structures. And as we go forward and we start looking at the reality of what demand destruction means in the context of, of, of stronger and stronger price signals, it is those rate uh, structures coupled with real-time data that will allow cities to manage demand destruction, as London has to, without the certainty of revenue destruction, which is inevitable as a function of demand destruction that will arise out of conservation. Thank you. You catch yourself when you find two text messages about going over by like five minutes. Uh, that's, uh, we're in the punitive area. One question less. Yeah, excellent. Um, good. So, uh, uh, smart water networks uh, are not yet the subject of, of uh, uh, analyst coverage, at least not extensive analyst coverage. But one of the uh, pioneers in covering the space is the Frost and Sunburn. And uh, Seth Cutler here with us today is uh, one of the people at the forefront of uh, covering this emerging space. Um, Seth is based in London and he heads the uh, water practice or whatever that's called in uh, Frost and Sullivan. So Seth, please, and do keep it to three minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 
very much, Guy. Uh, as you said, my name is Seth Cutler, and I'm a research analyst in the Environment and Building Technologies team, uh, but I do have a focus on water markets within Frost and Sullivan. Um, my main analysis is on smart cities, smart water metering, smart water grids. Um, my slides do have quite a bit of information, but I will keep it brief. Uh, if anyone does have further questions or want to talk through some of the ideas, uh, do feel free to talk to me later or send an email on my address here. So looking at the overall market and kind of taking a bit of an eagle eye view, um, we do see in around 2010 there is $5.8 billion invested in smart water grids. So this is going past smart water metering but actually analyzing a lot of the instruments, hardware, analytical software, uh, design engineering that was applied in this. By 2020 we see this growing to over $22 billion uh, at a global pace annually. Uh, about uh, at 2020, 29% of water networks in the world will be considered smart. Um, so this is a global, global number, it does vary by region, um, and it also has uh, not by full utility, but it's actually done by the network pipeline. Now where is this money coming from? Uh, so on this slide, it's essentially looking at the landscape of the smart water grid universe. Um, on the left, you've got more of the vertical industries, so looking at design and engineering, uh, the physical infrastructure and sensors, you have communications options, control and automation, and analytical so software. We've kept the last true two, control and automation and analytical software, separate, as they still can exist as separate markets, uh, but we do expect going forward they will start to combine as we move towards a top-down approach uh, to smart water grids. Um, we also see cybersecurity as a big important process within this, both looking internally within organizations with access to information and dissemination of information, um, as well as from the outside of people getting access in. Sorry about that. Um, so the slide before was really looking at the horizontal breadth to the market. What are the different applications? Who is involved in this? Um, this next slide here is really looking at the depth. The relationships in the previous slide, it, it presented a bit statically. There are certain groups that are working together with utilities to provide a smart water grid. This slide here is trying to convey the depth to this. Uh, these relationships aren't static. They are indeed moving. Companies are very much engaged in different types of uh, verticals where they can move, where they might be able to partner up with other strategic companies, where they could form a merger and acquisition to move into it. So in this slide, it's really trying to convey the depth to this, the depth to this process. So on the left you have the vertical markets and across the center it moves you know, where they could be going, where they are currently working, uh, where they are likely to move. So it's really just to convey the depth of this process, the complex relationships we're seeing in today's market. Um, it is a growth market, there's a lot of uh, current M&A activity, there's a lot of strategic partnerships going on. Uh, anyone involved in this market really needs to be aware of these relationships, whether you're a utility looking to make uh, some initial investments, whether you're an investor looking at companies involved in this market, uh, certainly companies looking in terms of their growth, uh, where do they want to be in five years, ten years, uh, where could they be? Sometimes it's just about the imagination of the process. Um, and so I think really, just to focus on today's, uh, yesterday's summit, just looking at the investor possibilities, looking at the different technologies we have access to and where they can move forward to uh, in the next years. I think this is a very important uh, idea just to convey the breadth and the depth as we move forward. Um, so we're now going to go uh, to a, a Q&A session or a proper panel, but there's actually one uh, free seat uh, on the stage. So we'll, let's have our short version of the Olympics here. So the first investor, venture capitalist to make it to stage that was <laughs> world record, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it's Ben Johnson, he's on drugs. So, uh, um, I'll, I'll use this mic, okay? I'll pass, pass it on later. Just, uh, I want to see the guys. So, uh, um, this is uh, Helge Dable from Emerald Ventures. I don't know how many of you were here yesterday for his panel, but he's a better moderator than I am. Do you want to do it? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, I'm going to start uh, picking on you, Pozoyan. Because you know you're a large company, or you represent a large company. You talk innovation, and smart water networks, and whatnot. But your processes, not necessarily only yours, but large corporates seem to be very slow in adopting technology and adapting to technology. 
and in the process, many good ideas and many uh, um, startups get uh, slaughtered. Um, so what are you doing to prevent that from happening, and is there anything that's different about the program that, that you were talking about than what we've seen in the past? So thank you for the, the question, but uh, I, I think that the, I understand the perception, okay, especially from a small company. But I, I do believe that uh, uh, larger corporations have, have improved that. Uh, talking for, you know, from Suez standpoint, actually we run what we call a technology test, where in, in three months we take a decision to go or not go for uh, industrial testing uh, the uh, a, a technology. And if it's uh, the sex, uh, if it's uh, successful, then it's introduced into our different premises. I take one example. One of the technologies that was used uh, was tested uh, this year uh, during uh, May to uh, July, went commercial in September, and we've started to sell uh, the technology from the uh, other company. Uh, we've made the first deal uh, end of December, so it can be quick. Okay. Uh, 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 second, uh, I think what is slow is that. The, the value chain is complex. It's a very complex value chain. Uh, we would love to introduce all those these technology in all the different, I would say, operations that we run. Unfortunately, uh, the capex is controlled by uh, the uh, municipal government, by different people, and uh, it's it's all about tariff and who's paying for it. And so, which is probably one uh, one of the reasons why it's so strong. Okay. So, uh, I mean. Is there anything different about uh, the way that you do things from other companies or from the way Swiss was acting before, or is it just a, a gradual improvement? Uh, but I, I think exactly the approach on, on, on uh, what I described, the technology test. We are uh, uh, currently running about uh, 30 different tests coming from different startups and uh, all mature companies because one of the examples that I've uh, taken was coming from the food industry, so a totally uh, unrelated industry, but which developed a technology that is very useful for the water industry. So we, we also try to manage technology transfer across <coughs> uh, the boundaries of the industry. So uh, I think that's one approach. I think the approach about corporate venturing and blue orange, I think blue orange is our corporate fund it's in the room. It's also a way to accelerate the pace of innovation. Uh, uh, and last but not least, I think it's uh, by being focused and systematic. Okay, when you're focused, you know where you want to go, you do it, and then you implement it. That's what we're trying to do. Great, thank you. Um, we'll pause here for uh, a question from the audience. If there's one. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, provocative David. Um, <coughs> busy joke. Um, smart water versus melonic regulators and politicians, perhaps. No politicians on stage, you know. Right? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Anyone? I think yes, there's, I mean, there's a regulatory scope to this, and I think um, in terms of the investment space, in terms of the technology development, and also the deployment of technologies. Um, it sometimes can seem that there are roadblocks as opposed to um, helping paths and introduce them. Um, I think sometimes there can be a focus on, on water stress a bit too much uh, when a lot of these benefits, a lot of the, the capabilities you're going to gain are much about the network optimization. Uh, I think they are about uh, encouraging consumer awareness, getting them much more engaged in the process um, because they're a bit um, outside of it now as, as they could be. Um, so I think part of it is going to be a change of awareness and how they view uh, this market, this ability, um, and that's going to come uh, with time, and I think there are positive signals coming out, certainly. Um, so I think that there will be changes and that will go ahead, but they're not quite a block. I wouldn't say they're a negative piece of this. They are positive. Uh, it is constructive, but I think some of it's just understanding the wider application and what this is about. Yeah, I, I think you made a very good point. I think we are talking a lot about what the scarcity is and the important issue. But all these technologies are about also improving the maintenance, the, uh, the investment that we do on the network, and the efficiency of the network. Uh, unfortunately, consumers are very sensitive to uh, the cost they pay on the water. They are less sensitive to the cost avoidance, uh, uh, or capex avoidance uh, occurring on the, on the municipality. So it's, it's much more difficult to communicate on that, and I think we should do it. Okay. Okay. 
you know, one, one of the largest impediments to smart water or smart grid adoption, particularly in power, but also in water, is the certainty of demand destruction that, that arises and, and the regulators not being able to cope with uh, revenue coupling, in most, certainly in the U.S., uh, which is the protection that you get from achieving conservation. And so um, for a utility to embrace uh, fully uh, these technologies uh, it nearly certainly uh, uh, leads to demand destruction, uh, which goes to revenue destruction. And so until we figure out how to incent uh, utilities, it's not so bad in the, on, the, on, the, on the water side because most municipalities most of the water sector is dominated by, in the U.S. by, uh, by municipalities, but in rate-regulated businesses, it's a big problem. Uh, Helge, you rushed to say yes. I'm going to ask for someone who did not yet make any investment in smart water technologies, but you're obviously biased, and you're a member of the solar forum, so I'm going. Uh, no, um, since you're already on stage. Um, What's so interesting about smart water network technologies? Why is it an interesting investment space, if at all? If at all. Well, yes. First of all, we are a member of SWAN because we strongly believe in the theme. And why is that? Um, first of all, it's a personal belief. Uh, I believe it is something that uh, the sector is lacking uh, to, to bring the sector to a dramatically different level. And now from an investor perspective, um, first of all, everything that is, that is uh, offered to the water sector, the, the big question is, does it matter? And we heard this morning the numbers, uh, 70 to 80% of the cost structure related to water is linked to what is buried in the ground. So it seems, it seems to uh, matter. Uh, then there needs to be a gap for us as, as an investor, and I think there, there is a big gap. It's on the on the aging infrastructure side, you can argue, but I think it's much more on the uncertainty side. Uh, I mean, the pipe can be aging, but if you look at the data, the pipe can last anywhere from 20 to 150 years. So you don't really know what to do when, and um, it's it goes on. It's not just related to the pipe assets. Where in most of the cases we don't really know what's happening in the network, we don't really know what's uh, what's going on with our asset, assets, and we need to be smart with that. And last but not least, you obviously do need a dynamic market, a market that is willing to adopt those kind of technologies. And with with what is what we see here on stage, that's happening, and it's also visible. Uh, on, on what we call the exit landscape. We need to exit our investments at one stage, and there is clearly uh, quite a competition uh, shaping up uh, utilities that uh, traditionally stand for best management practices around the networks. They should ensure to keep that position. You have IT players moving in, you have SCADA and sensor providers moving in, model, modeling companies, uh, large, large consulting groups, and new industrials that we that we heard about yesterday, the Hitachi, <coughs> the Samsung, and so on. So, all that to me leads to actually a fantastic space as an as an investor. I think it's a spectacular way to get the same stuff. Um, we've got two water utilities, who are actually both technology companies as well uh, on stage. I want to ask you. Uh, I want to take you back to the show business and specifically to the uh, show me the money, right? The, business cases or the ROI, which, again, from my experience as a small vendor, and I guess from many other people's experiences, uh, business cases built by utilities seem to be done by the person who's buying this specific widget for the specific problem. And the bigger or wider effect of the technology is typically not considered or very hard uh, to make the case for it. So what has been your experience, both on, as utilities when new technologies are being introduced to you, but also when you come up with, with something new, can you actually uh, bake all the benefit and value in, you know, in a single business case? Okay, I, I think you're perfectly right in the sense that uh, it has been an extremely decentralized, uh, I would say, uh, business. Uh, an industry and, and the force of, I would say, 
centralization and standardization that existed in other industry, I'm coming from the chemical industry myself, 22 years, the chemical industry, where actually globalization forces, standardization forces help to implement solutions rapidly. In a world where uh, municipal government is extremely powerful, where you have decentralized your operation to local things, it takes a longer time to uh, uh, bring the information and, and diffuse it. A and we have quite a bit of initiatives uh, uh, within Suez uh, to go because we believe that it's going to be a more standardized business. Uh, we believe that technology will be adopted faster. Uh, the better technology will be uh, implemented in uh, operation very rapidly in the future, and we are aiming to that. But we have to change the culture, okay. which is slower. For and very important to when you build business cases for new technologies, can you or how can you make sure that all the benefits are properly considered? Is there a way to do it, or is it just you know, wait? No, it's not wait actually. Uh, it's about, I would say, when vendors like uh, small companies like Takedu or other companies are, are visiting us, I think it's part of the discussion about to build the business case. Uh, again, the business case used to be built locally because you had to negotiate with the local regulators for implementing the, the technology and so on. So that needs to be taken into account. Uh, but I think it's part also of the education and it's part also of, uh, of the evolution of the business model. Uh, we have technologies which are implemented across the board, uh, slower than uh, we could, I would say, uh, do it in other industry. But I think uh, the pace is accelerating and it's, uh, it's going to be the future. And for the business cases, I think it's part of, uh, of the exercise to do it. So in our particular case, um, if we could have bought it, <coughs> we would have, right? The tech, the technology, the the we were early adopters of AMI technology. What 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 you find is that to surface the value of the data in a useful way for utility is not something the technology companies have, have mastered. Far from it. Uh, that technology arose from widget manufacturers and who have a. Uh, I think a fundamental lack of understanding of the of the utility business, and so as a function of that, we built our own interfaces, um, and I recruited technology guys from the tech space to do it. Uh, and at the end of that process, we were so certain that it was uh, unique and that it couldn't be bought that, that we then marketed it on a, on a real business model. And so, to answer your second question, uh, when we then went out. Uh, to sell uh, this platform to other utilities, uh, we branded it as Utilities Utility Solutions as a means of trying to bridge the, the uber conservative views that most utility uh, owners have. There are three critical barriers to entry in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the water utility space, particularly in the US, because of the nature of the fact that 85% of it is in municipal hands. Risk aversion, lack of IT infrastructure, lack of capital. So the business model we created uh, coupled all those all those things together, and it's sold on an economic basis as competing uh, product against their own practices. And, and when we did that, we made we boiled it down to one very simple premise. Now the technology behind it is very complicated, but that's not what we're selling. We're selling efficiency, monetizing efficiency in a very obvious way. And in that way, we think that's an unusual attraction. Any <laughs> <laughs> questions for you, Laurie? Uh, I can probably speak uh, from... As Guy probably knows, and he's probably just terrified, I have a lot to say on the subject. But I'd like to try and propose or, or frame my question out of what I'm going to say in a moment. I mean, there's a whole smart grid concept that's been borrowed from the electricity smart grid, which is all about balancing supply and demand. And the most exciting thing, when we talk about smart, everybody thinks about meters, and then we have a journalist who shows a picture of a fridge, and so some intelligence is going in and out of the fridge. It misses the point, in my view, and the exciting thing around what's happening in smart meter and smart grid in the US is around automatic demand response. Standardizing signals to be able to send to consumers to regulate their, their behavior against market prices. 
and this is a standard called ADR2, which is uh, about to be rolled out, and so every washing machine you buy will have an ADR2 uh, uh, chip, which talks the data interface to the generators and distributors who are sending out the price signals related to the market. Replication, and standardization, <coughs> and reusability. We have nothing, we don't even have a beginning of debate on this subject in the water industry. Uh, on his own. I'm doing something passionately here in the UK, um, hopefully in Europe, and hopefully in the country part of the US as well. I'd like to propose today that as a result, or at this forum, I just coined the term SWIP, which is a smart water information model. And we, we can begin to work on this. We need to have industry working on SWIP, we need to have suppliers working on SWIM, we need to have system integrators combined with SWIM, we need to have consultants aware of SWIM, so they can specify it in their uh, specification. We urgently need, if we're going to get these various data sources connected together, we urgently need to address a set of interface standards to deliver this value and potential and opportunity which we're talking about over the few days. Thanks. Sorry for the concise yeah, question. Yeah, I think you're preaching to a choir here, but anyone from the choir here to see? <laughs> yeah, I think in terms of data standards, it is very important you look at the, the various amounts of technologies we have, the different analytical systems you have, um, the different ways they're going to be applied within different networks, within different functions within a utility, or whether it's uh, commercial industrial practices. So in terms of having making sure that it all can communicate to make sure that data is transferable, that you can analyze it in, in efficient ways, and I think to ensure the, the longevity of some of these systems by having them on a kind of agreed standard, they can have a, a shelf life that could be longer than maybe the company life, that it could be better integrated into a future solution if a company were to, to fold or, or ditch their, their product. And I think that would be important for utilities investing in a lot of these uh, uh, analytical systems where there's use of the data. So I think it, this uh, simplified, standardized system is very important. Uh, and I think any sort of uh, standard that's built up should have sort of a group recognition. I think it should be evaluated externally from a third party, uh, and it should also be able to have user buy-in, a way they can kind of engage with it as well would be very important in creating a data standard. Um, but I think that is very important. Going ahead. Thanks for that. Um, so before we all swim away to lunch, uh, I want to take another question from the audience, and I do have one more question I'd like to ask each and every one of you before I let you conclude. Um, we're talking about clean water quite a lot. Is there anything smart, smart in the sense of data driven, that can be done in the wastewater side of things? Have you seen anything? Are you playing around with anything? Obviously, it's and for me, Bojo and Heather. Well, first, first of all, there are smart things uh, going on on the wastewater side. That's where I'm actually originally academically come from. Uh, real time control is, is the name that is used here in, in uh, wastewater or in sewer networks. You have a lot of automation going on today on the wastewater treatment plants. But, and here's the but, uh, it is quite a different segment, uh, I would call a different segment to the drinking water side. First of all, the objective functions might differ very strongly from location to location. Sometimes it's about optimizing the wastewater treatment plan uh, related to infiltration that happens into the sewers. So you're treating basically a lot of clean water. Uh, sometimes it's related to stormwater uh, overflows and so on. Um, on top of that, mostly you don't have that much of a, of a technical outfit within sewers. So that's, that's also a challenge. I think there is more work to be done on the equipment or the sensor side yet to bring it to a big or medium data, data level. So those are sort of the challenges that I see there, but obviously it would be great if you understand it. I just fear that from the original setting as well as from the economic drivers around it, it's not such a strong case as with drinking water yet. So you're not excited as an investor? I'm skeptical. I'm excited uh, because I think it's... You're German, of course you're skeptical. So, yes. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's listen to the French. <laughs> <laughs> well, pro 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 probably uh, uh, on the energy side, on the energy optimization of uh, wastewater treatment plant, there are a lot of things uh, going on right now. Uh, optimiza energy optimization scheme. I think the stormwater uh, management uh, is a combination of, uh, uh, of 
uh, ICT technology as well as I would say the network itself and the, and the infrastructure and, and, and it's a means to reduce the, uh, the investment in the infrastructure. Uh, but I do agree, the, uh, the sewer network is uh, are certainly less equipped and it's not uh, under pressure, so it's, it's a different story. But I think there is things that uh, have to be done there. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, got another one of my own. I'm going to pick on you, Seth, this time. Um, you know, when, when you read about smart water, it's typically smart metering. And it seems like everyone is talking about smart meters and all the data is about smart meters and, and there's less work and less uh, certainty about the rest of it. So are you trying to break this paradigm and uh, you know, are you going to try and share with us some numbers from the smart water network, bro? Um, well, I mean, yes. Uh, the, the lucky answer to that is that we do have a smart grid or a smart water network report coming out over the next month or so. Um, so it is looking much more at the wider sort of universe of this and how do you quantify it and how do you, uh, how do you measure it? What, what is it made of? What, what is the, the landscape and the definitions? Um, you are right though that it's, it's kind of gray areas when you move into some of these uh, applications within the grid, so it is harder uh, to quantify and to understand. Um, but it is certainly moving forward. I think in the metering port that we came out with, another good understanding that we started off from, that it wasn't just about the meters itself. It was quantifying the meters, but it was extending it to looking at installation costs, and it was looking at the data network management fees. Um, so it is very much about building it around the meters, but it is, again, expanding out into the grid, into the networks, understanding the different applications and how you can address that. Um, so I think everyone is aware of it, but it is it can be a bit more difficult to get a grasp of. And I think for, for a growing market, you kind of start with a smaller piece and you build out, uh, and you sort of build on that research excellence. Great. Um, okay, last question to each and every one of you. The Holy Grail. If there's one thing you want to have or you've seen that you think is the, uh, you know, the big, big opportunity or has the biggest potential in the smart water realm, what would that be? It could be something that does not exist in the way. Sure. Well, I would actually <coughs> make a top level statement and not refer to any specific technology. I think the holy grail is to, to ensure that there's a real time image of the network, whatever network, sewer or, or a drinking water network, that is coupled with a process that ensures that all resources are used efficiently uh, to provide the service that needs to happen. So Automated or human driven? I mean, we're, we're, we're where possible, automate it, but uh, there will always be some, since it's a service, since it's a customer relation, there will always be uh, <coughs> interaction with the human resource. But that's, I mean, it's not a holy grail, it's more an, an, a vision of what should happen. Holy grail, I don't think that they exist. Holy cow, holy cow, I don't know. Anyway, I think probably, I would say, a, a, a bit more standardization and industrialization to fast to uh, make things happen quicker. Uh, and we are still in a very divergent mode, and I think which makes things difficult and decision uh, difficult to take, so a little bit more standardization. Uh, I think kind of building on the standardization point um, but from maybe more market perspective is just looking at all the varied companies that are involved with this, looking at uh, the five layers here in front of you. There are different companies and different layers here. Um, and they all have to, at the end of the day, link up together to provide a, a functional smart network. Um, so I think the closer you can get to, to intercompany integration in products, the way they can link up more effectively uh, is going to help help uh, utilities really roll this out, reduce risk, uh, and really see the, the benefit of them. So uh, from my perspective, if you think of the Holy Grail as what would be most useful for a, for a utility um, U.S maybe anywhere, I, I just pick up on what Helga said, this is a, a real-time visualization of the network, qualitative, quantitative, but then also dynamic, so that you could, as a city, uh, tinker with rates and determine what the elastic response might be and what that does to your cost structures and what that does to CapEx, uh, I think would be highly valuable. We're not, we're not there yet. We don't have those good predictive models. It's, it's difficult to know where to spend the next dollar uh, in London on CapEx, 
And I think that if, if you could uh, have that, all of these functions communicated together that were that generated a very simple response, that would be that would be utopia for most utilities. Great. Last question. And so we're done. And thank you very much uh, for staying with us. I think lunch is being served, right? So, uh, great. What I think.